Hello, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I see a few people coming in. We are happy to have you. We're getting started in about a minute. Okay, so welcome everyone again, and thank you for joining us. I'm very glad to be here. I'll go ahead and walk you through a few slides before we get started with our webinar today. So we'll be talking about what's new in Civil 3D and InfraWorks 2022. My name is Riga Bashkenji. I'm a marketing specialist representing the civil engineering industry here at Autodesk. We have an exciting webinar for you, and we're going to go ahead and get started. All right, before we get to the good stuff, I want to make sure to remind you that this webinar might make some forward-looking statements. Please do not take any of these statements as a promise or guarantee of product delivery, and don't make any purchasing decisions off of these forward statements. The next thing I'm covering here are some logistics on how this webinar works. I know a few of you, all of you are joining through um, Zoom. So you are joining this webinar with your computer's audio system. So if at any time you experience audio issues, try refreshing your web browser or try switching to a new web browser. That should usually fix the issue. You also have the option to dial in by phone. Next, we have team members standing by to answer your questions throughout this entire webinar. Please don't be shy. You can locate the Q&A box on, on Zoom and type in your questions at any time. There are lots of people joining this webinar. We will do our best to get to all of the questions, but we do apologize if we can't get to every question. Lastly, at the end of this presentation, we will have a live Q&A session. Final note I have here, I'd like to mention that this webinar will be recorded. So don't worry if you've missed anything, we will send you an email with a link to the recording, also sharing it on the chat, and you can feel free to share it with your colleagues. All right, now we'll kick off a few polling questions to better understand who's all joining us. Let's start with our first question. So our first question here, what type of projects are you currently involved with? I'll give you a few moments to answer. You can pick all of the answer choices that apply to you. If your answer is different, please feel free to let us know in the Q&A box. Okay, I see some answers coming in. A few moments left. All right, I will now close the poll and share the results. Okay, I can see site land development is um, the projects that you guys are currently involved with. Okay, awesome. Next, can we please Turn on the next polling question. Okay, this is the second one. Which type of firm do you currently work for? A few moments to answer as well. If your answer is different, let us know in the Q&A box. Okay, let's close the poll question and share the results. All right, I see multidiscipline AEC firm is the most popular. Thank you for sharing the result. I will move to the next question. What is your level of familiarity with grading optimization? A few questions coming in. Your answer is coming in, sorry. Awesome, I see most of you have heard of it. Okay. 
Awesome. Okay, that's very interesting. Most of you have heard of grading optimization. All right. So, okay, with that out of the way, I'm very excited to introduce our presenters for today. You have an amazing set of speakers that have deep experience in civil engineering and knowledge of our civil design software. Please welcome John Sayer, Ben Wardle, and Andy Mains from our infrastructure technical marketing team. We'll start with John. John, whenever you are ready, I'll hand the floor off to you. You can take over the screen share. All right. Thank you, Rita. Let me share my screen here. All right, so thank you everyone for coming today. I'm very excited to be able to, to show you my piece of this webinar and it is going to be about grading optimization. Um, one thing I did wanna to bring to everybody's attention though, right before we before we dive right into to grading optimization is that uh, it, was, it was brought to my attention, I probably needed to mention that the DWG format for Civil 3D and AutoCAD period did not change. So uh, we still are uh, on the same format uh, for DWG. So I wanted to make sure everybody understood that. It's always important to, to know at the at the beginning or at, at release time, and it is usually a question that gets asked. So it is the same DWG format that you've been working with. Um, another thing, if I mention the word GO, that is the short version of grading optimization. Um, if you say grading optimization 1,500 times in a row, like I'm probably going to do today, you want to call it GO. All right, so when I mentioned GEO, that's what I'm talking about, this grading optimization. So uh, I did see in the polls that there was a lot of folks that are doing uh, a lot of, uh, of site work and commercial work uh, for maybe site plans, grading plans for residential subdivisions, things of that nature. Also saw a lot of people uh, are doing a lot of stormwater projects. So Grading is always something that we start with when we do any project, whether it be a roadway project or it be site design or whatever. So grading optimization is going to give you a, a big leg up, all right? So what I'm going to do is talk you through how I put together this particular project and explain just a few of the new grading objects that you'll use to, to show you that it it's uh, it's, it's pretty much the same setup for every project, except the project conditions kind of dictate how you set uh, the, the different zones and the different uh, building pad elevations and maybe detention pond sizing and all of that. So we're gonna start at the very beginning. Um, it's probably gonna go a little bit, it's probably gonna go a little bit fast um, because I don't have as much time as I've had in the past to do this presentation. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. So. Whenever you install Civil 3D 2022, you're going to have uh, grading optimization, or actually grading optimization is a separate install. So uh, you need to download it also off of manage.autodesk.com and it will install separately. So it does show up right underneath Civil 3D in the AEC collection. So you will be able to download it from there. I want to be sure everybody understands that. We will access that here under analyze, just so everybody knows, right here at the end. These are the different um, this is the panel for grading optimization. Now, one thing you will see whenever you open up uh, Civil 3D 2022 is you will see your list of uh, grading objects inside of your tool palette, all right? So this tool palette is the same one we've been, been pulling assemblies and subassemblies and things of that nature from forever. But there is a, a grading object imperial tab and there's also a grading object metric tab that you can use but we're gonna be focusing on the Imperial today. And you'll be able to see all of the different grading objects that you can pull from, all right? These grading objects work much the same as building an assembly out of sub-assemblies, okay? So uh, if, we, if we look down through here, we're gonna talk about zones a lot today, okay? So if I wanted to pick that, uh, if I pick zone, then I just select the object that I want to be a zone, okay? So it's just like, your interaction that you would uh, have if you built a assembly out of sub-assemblies from this menu. Now you can also select and right click and copy each one of these. So if you wanted to go in here and create one, uh, a zone that was consistent with how you wanted to grade you know, on, on every project, um, you could actually go in and set these constraints and they would allow you or 
then it would allow you just to pick that particular grading object here off the tab or off the, the uh, palette and you would be able to just pick it and go. Okay, so very customizable. Uh, it's a great way to do things. If you've, if you've got a certain way that you grade every single time, then um, you can just set those zones up. All right, so we have inside of here, we have low points, bounded points, um, aligned edges, bend lines, drain lines. We're gonna use drain lines today. You'll use drain lines on every project, okay? Um, elevation offsets, we do have a couple here in the project. Zones, we will use zones not, not, uh, not specifically all the time, but I mean, you use zones for, you can make a zone do anything, okay? So um, just to remember a zone or just something to understand is that a zone, if you put the word grading in front of it, it'd be grading zone, right? So that is basically a closed polygon or poly, closed polyline that is, you're wanting to control the grading in a specific way, okay? So think about it, you're gonna have different zones for everything on your grading plan, okay? Or how you wanna grade specific things. The zone is where you wanna go first, okay? So if, you, if you're having a, a struggle as to which one of these uh, grading objects to start with, the zone is the one to start with, okay? And even if you build just a grading limit, an interior zone and two drain lines to show the direction of flow, that's the way to start, okay? Just, just it, it can work on this project that I'm gonna show you here and it works the exact same way on your projects, okay? So basically creating two closed polylines and then two polylines period, just lines to represent drain lines, that's all you need to get started using grading optimization, okay? We're gonna talk, uh, you can create what's called exclusive zones. We have the detention pond that we can actually pick and we're gonna build one right here today. Um, we can set our building pad. Uh, the reveal actually works with the building pad. Think about it a reveal if you've ever seen, if any of you have ever seen my presentations before on, uh, on a different project, we had a truck well, okay? So there's a four foot reveal of the concrete where the truck backs down. That's what a reveal is. It can also be controlling sidewalk and things of that nature on how it enters a building. You have, they did create us a grading limit. We are gonna definitely have a grading limit. You have to have it, you need a grading limit on every project. So they created us a zone that's already generated as a grading limit. Uh, we have a parking lot, sidewalk and accessible path. Uh, the way I kind of explain sidewalk and accessible path, sidewalk is like a trail, all right? So if we had a trail that's running from right here up into this walk area or around this trail area, we could make that a sidewalk, okay? If it's an accessible path, think of that as going into a building. So a sidewalk that's like right here and it was going into this building, that's what we would use for accessible path, all right? So that kind of gives you just a brief overview of what the different grading objects are and what they do. We're gonna concentrate on drain lines, zones. Uh, we are gonna look at a, a building pad and uh, the detention pond, all right? So let's get started. So I said what you needed to do to start working on the project is, is, is have two zones, all right? So the, the first zone that we created was where, basically it outlines the area that we want to grade, okay, the area that we're focusing on. In this particular instance, everything outside of that line right there, okay, that's my grading, my grading limit, and that is a zone, okay, so I picked zone and then selected that polyline. That is just a 2D polyline, okay, and it's closed. That's all it has to be, it's just a 2D polyline. So once we have selected that and created it, then we go in and we set a few things, all right, so our uh, we wanted to be sure that we select customized slope constraints, which allows us to set a min drain slope and a max slope, all right? So you can see my min slope is zero and my max slope is 33%, so that's three to one. That's how I wanted to grade from my interior zone back to my grading limit, okay? These grading limits can be grip edited, so I could grab this grip and move it over if I wanted to move things in and out to give it a little bit more room to where it can daylight. Um, that's one way to look at things whenever you're you're looking at the different scenarios that you're grading. So we have the ability to do that and then jump right back into the solver and let it run again. Okay, so that's the beauty of grading optimization is the fact that you can you can do so many different grading scenarios, okay, and change things and rerun it and it gives you a whole new grading plan. All right, so I think you'll see that here today. 
So we basically just set up the grading limit uh, as we give it a min-max slope and we tell it that we want it to be the grading limit, okay? So very simple. I'm gonna shut this down here. Then I went in and created a polyline to represent where I wanted to do basically like my pad grading, all right? So it's going to start daylighting from this line to this line. I picked the wrong line there. This line to this line. Once I set the parameters for how I wanted to grade inside of this zone, okay? And they are different than how I wanted it to grade for the grading limit. So I'm gonna select that zone and show you this. I, I'm giving it some leeway here, all right? So I want it to slope max 6%. I'd like to keep it as flat as I can, um, but the minimum I want it to slope is 2% in this area. So we can adjust these values as we do iterations of our grading plan, okay? So we run, we process the grading plan, and then we go back and we can change this. We can change it inside the solver, and I'll show you that here in a minute too. So that's again, when I talk about iterations of the grading plan, it's simple to come in and change this, say I, I, I didn't want it to be 6%, I want it to be 7%, go back up and hit optimize and rerun it, okay? Um, and we can do this directly inside of our solver itself. I'll show you that. So that's all I set. I just told it how I wanted my min and my max slope to be set here in this particular zone. Now, we did layer some things on, all right? So uh, you can see our grading limit here. If I can pick things, right? Good grief. All right. And I do have a sidewalk that runs right here along this road, and it turns and goes up. Okay, so I want that sidewalk to be to be uh, handicap accessible. So I don't want it to have a slope of more than 2%, all right? So we generated a zone for that and told it just that. I don't want it to slope more, or my men's slope was 1%. We do still want it to shed water, but we don't want it to go over 2%, okay? So you're gonna see whenever this optimizes, you're gonna see those contours come up and generate and actually show you it's a 2% slope, which is different than what we have going across to our building. Which brings me to my next zone, all right? I know that I want my entrance here to my building to be somewhat relative to the road. And you can see that there's quite a bit of elevation change across that building per the road. So my entrance is here. So if I just hover over this contour and look, that's at 5595, okay? Well, say that uh, the low point the, or well, the lowest area on the road to get in would be 5594, all right? So I know that there's quite a bit of elevation change or there's going to be once I set my building pad elevation that I want to achieve. So I built a zone that does overlap on top of the the sidewalk, actually, the sidewalk overlaps on top of the of this particular zone. It's a transition zone. And I just told it from, I gave it a min slope of 1% and a max slope of 10%. Because in this area down here, because of the fall of the road and where we're going to be with our sidewalk and where the building finish floor is going to be, it's it's going to definitely probably use 10%. Now, again, we can adjust this on the, adjust this on the fly, okay? So I've built my grading limit zone, my grading pad zone, how I want it to grade in front of the building and then behind the building to my grading limit. I built a zone for um, transition, all right, from the grading limit in. And then I, I built a sidewalk and laid it on top of it. So we'll need to order those so that it reads them like a layering system, okay? So it looks at the grading limit, then it looks at, in this particular instance, this transition zone, then it would look at the sidewalk, then it would look at my building pad, okay? So I also have a building pad that I've actually set, a couple different ways we can do this. I can actually tell it in, in this particular instance, I told, I gave it a, an elevation difference that I wanted to see, okay? 5594 to 5596, okay? I could take this off, level with grading pad. If I wanted it to move up and down with the site, if I'm trying to balance, then I, I would shut this elevation off and I would tell it, just make it level with, with the pad, level grading with pad. And it would set this finished floor for me. But I know because of our conversation here around this, this elevation at the road, I know I want that to be at this elevation range. So I'm gonna leave that the way it is. If we need to change one of these, we can do that later on, all right? I also, for the sake of time, 
Um, I have uh, several different, or well, I say several, I have another uh, zone here, actually here for this particular area. I've actually created a zone here that I want to be flat. If you wanna know how I created a closed polyline out of a circle and then was able to use it as a closed polyline, there's a tiny break in it in the circle and then you can create it, uh, or then you can create a zone out of it, all right? I also used elevation offset. So it's going to look at this zone's elevation and the elevation that is uh, being looked at here. And it's gonna offset that one to two feet, a min offset of one foot and a max offset of two feet. So this circle needs, is gonna be up in the air a little bit, all right? And I controlled it just by drawing a regular polyline from here at the high to the low, okay? That's how these are drawn. Uh, and that's how grading optimization works with it. Now, you also have flow lines. This is the direction of flow. Again, this polyline needs to be generated from top to bottom, okay? So high point to low point, and then I generated another one that was, I believe, high point to low point, if I remember right. Just remember that the polyline for a, a drain line needs to be built. When you pick the first point, that's the high point of where you're wanting it to drain. So all of these zones will look for these particular drain lines. And those drain lines, by the way, can be inside the grading limit or outside the grading limit. So we've got our pond here. We'll, look, we'll talk about that here in a minute, but let's jump right in and go to optimize. So if I select optimize here, it asks me for my existing ground surface. This is my existing surface. So it's, I'm gonna select it and it's gonna fire off the optimizer, all right? So you can see all of the different zones here inside of the optimizer. So if I select say this zone here, it highlights and it gives me the same options that I had in, in Civil 3D. So this is what I mean by if I start the optimizer and it starts working and it's telling me earthwork quantities and all of that, and I say, you know what, this is not gonna work. I can stop it and I can change any of these parameters right here and then hit optimize again and let it roll, all right? Let it start to generate a new grading plan. All right, so that's what I mean by iteration. So a couple things to remember um, that we can expand any of this out. It gives you all of the different things that we had in uh, inside of Civil 3D. We have everything right here in the optimizer. So I can pick each one of these and it highlights them. See, it highlighted my grading limit here, highlighting my grading limit for my pond. Uh, here's my transition, then my sidewalk. And notice how they're layered right on top of each other. All right, same thing for pond. And I do wanna show you this detention pond. There's a lot of things that you can actually set for the pond, right? Like you, you can make it be a dry pond or a wet pond, all right? You can give it the minimum storage volume that you want, all right? And then give it a max storage depth. You can tell it to uh, allow boundary change, meaning I drew this polyline. That's what I think the size needs to be. But if it needs to move that out or bring it in or shrink it, uh, and it still achieves the minimum storage value or volume and the max storage uh, depth, then guess what? It moves it in on its own. Sometimes you won't want that, but uh, you can check that on and it does work very nicely. You can also create a safety bench inside of here so we can uh, tell it the different depths for the safety bench. Also here for berm, you can create a berm all the way around it. You can tell it that you want a, a specific amount of freeboard and the inside slopes for the grading. All right, if I pick safety bench here, then it gives me the, uh, the safety bench options that I can set. So my depth, my width, and my slope. All right, so with that, uh, we're gonna go ahead and start to optimize this because we have everything in here that we want. All right, one thing before I do though, if I didn't want to optimize, I wanted to optimize the pond separately, all right? It's still here, but I just don't want to be working with it. Then you can go here to the pond and you can tell it right here, you can toggle it and make it not active. You can actually shut it off, okay? So that's the inside of the pond. I could go back here to this pond, shut this off and then make it not visible. And then you understand what you see is what you get, right? So you're seeing the grading that it's gonna be working on. So I'm gonna turn those back on real quick and we're back to good. All right, so let's optimize. And I want you to also remember, this is real time. There's nothing going on here <laughs> that I've recorded. So you're gonna see it working real time. Um, 
so there we go. It starts to, to optimize things. It starts to work with the grading. You can see things start to take shape. Really pay attention to this sidewalk because it is going to make these contours all 2%, which is fantastic, okay? We want to be sure that we're compliant with all of the rules. If we want to kind of figure out where we're at, we can go here to our visualization toolbar and we can select violations, okay? Anything in the deep red, we can highlight and it tells us what it's, what it's, what's violating, okay? So the slope right now, that's on the building pad. That's not a good uh, option there. Uh, the slope, uh, the max slope for this particular area was 6% and it's at 7.73. It looks like it's actually fixed that now. Notice that if you go into an area that is grayed out and it's not red, then the, there is no violation in that area. But the great thing is, is that you can highlight over or hover over these different red areas and it'll tell you how it's actually, um, how it's actually being violated, okay? That helps us if we have to go back and change any of the parameters. All right, I'll go back here. We do have one other thing uh, that I wanna show you and these are called the direction vectors, okay? This gives you the design intent. So you can see these arrows don't change whenever the grading's going on. The arrows just point in the direction that you were wanting to actually have things flow on your grading plan. So it's a great way to look at, even before you go to hit grading optim or optimize here at the bottom. So you can see that the arrows are not pointing the opposite direction. So these are all pointed this direction. You know, if it was all pointing back towards the building, we know we need to change something. This right here is an issue, all right? So I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna hit stop, and I'm gonna go back to the building pad. Remember I told you we could change things on the fly, and I'm gonna add that back on level grading with a pad, all right? Then I'm just gonna hit optimize. It's gonna start over, okay? But how fast is that, okay? And think about it in your head, what would you have to do if you were grading this with feature lines? So that fast, we're gonna give it about a minute to, to optimize again. While it's optimizing, if we wanna see how it is progressing with the optimization, I can pick the convergence plot. And what you need to understand here is that this needs to be traveling down. If it hits a hiccup, okay, in something, a parameter that you can't get past, okay? It's not the, it, I guess we could call it the easy button, but it's not gonna grade something that's magical, okay? It's only gonna work with the parameters that you give it. And if it can't grade it, then, I, I can promise you it it you need to change something, okay? Change a slope, something so that it can meet those parameters. So just watch this as it goes up and down. And what ultimately what we want it to do is run till it gets to the bottom, all right? Then it's done. If it comes and levels out, then you can take a look at the grading and see if you like it. If you like it, then keep it. If you don't, then go in and change a parameter on one of the zones, uh, push the slope up, do something uh, to, to make a change and then rerun it. And it will, uh, you'll eventually get down to the bottom here. All right, so I am almost out of time. I'm gonna show you what, what happens whenever we're done. So if I hit stop, all right, and I hit send optimize result, all right, it is gonna bring it back to civil 3D. We can bring the feature lines that it generated inside of the grading. We can bring those in. We're just going to bring the surface for today. So I'll select surface, have it create a new one, and I'll call this uh, Geo. And we can select the style. I'll hit finish. And lo and behold, it is here. All right. So you can see that all of my, my grading and everything that was generated from Geo is right here in this plan. We could go up and do an earthwork if we wanted to, to check against what it gave us inside of grading optimization. Or if we don't like this at all, you can simply pick it and erase it and go back to optimize and build a whole new surface, okay? Very, very quickly. All right, that's the short version of, I, I could talk about grading optimization for three hours. I would love to do that. So, uh, but I can't today. So I am going to, Go ahead and turn things over to Ben Wardell and let him show you uh, some more great new features in Civil 3D 2022 and, and maybe an InfraWorks feature too, right? That's right. Thanks, John. So I'm only going to turn on my uh, video for here just, just for a second, just because I want everyone to be able to see, focus more on uh, what I'm about to show here um, within Civil 3D rather than me. So that said... I'm gonna turn that off. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see everything. John, let me know if you cannot see what, I'm, what I've am what i got here. Nope, I can see uh, it. 
Great. So um, one of the new features within Civil 3D is in regards to connected alignments. Previously, when we would have crossing alignments, um, generally a lot of people would use those for corridor creation or for something like this for ramps. We've got a, a clover leaf interchange here. They have added uh, some some complexity to the uh, the um, to these alignments to these. Uh, connected alignment workflow. And I'm, I'm gonna demonstrate some of that here. So in this case, a case like this, we might have uh, an interchange that has a compound curve or some complexity to it. Um, and I'm just gonna get into this and just show you briefly how this works. Um, this isn't gonna take a, a lot of time, but I select the two different alignments in the direction that I'm, that I'm actually moving in the, the direction that I actually wanna create that alignment. And I select the quadrant that I'm in and I hit enter. So this comes up and this is this is pretty standard as far as how connected alignments have worked in the past. Um, I can give it the name, the description. I can even get into the design criteria if I wanna use some of the design criteria uh, standards that are available or if, if I've got something from Ashto or, or something else like that. You know, I can enter that information right here um, as well as setting you know, some of the design criteria. So let's say this is a 40 mile an hour ramp right here. Um, in the parameters, this is where things have really kind of changed. Previously, you had the opportunity to create a circular fillet. And that was essentially what you had. You had, you had a curve, you could specify the curve and then the length and the offset. They've expanded the capabilities here by giving you some opportunities to create uh, spiral curve spirals or some combination of different spirals as well. And I'll show you a couple of these different things. Uh, let's pick a complex one here. Um, the way that we can set this up and the way that we can see that it works is if I select these uh, this little three dot button, this will show me the layout of what Civil 3D will create as my connected alignment. And with each one of these items that I select, it will highlight the area that I'm actually looking at. So if I wanna specify the spirals in the spiral out, um, I can revise all that information right here. I can also specify the type of curve that I want. In this case, we've got a direct connection ramp. Um, and so we would wanna be less than 180 degrees. Um, if we wanted to get into a loop ramp, we, we might be able to specify that here. In a case like this, where we have this connected ramp, we just have basically a compound curve. So I'll pick this three centered arc. Now with the three centered arc, I don't have that loop ramp option to, to pick here, but I am gonna get into this and just kind of show um, the way that this uh, model is laid out. So I can specify my radius um, I can also specify the length, or if I know my degree of curve, I can also specify that as well. If I change this one, if I change this to 200, then this will automatically adjust. Uh, some of these values will are, are linked in that regard. I'll keep that as that. Um, I've measured this before, and this is about a 100 foot radius as far as that, that center curve. And then I've got the, ex, the exiting uh, radius as well. I've got all of these other items set to my offset. I'm about, it's basically three lanes as far as the offset in each direction. And when I hit OK, then it generates my alignment. And I can get in and look at this and see I'm, I'm pretty close as far as I'm, I'm just mimicking basically the, the layout of this right here. Um, if I was creating something like this from, from a design standpoint, I might want to adjust this. And I've got the grips that I can do something like that if I need to pull that in or out. And then I can review the geometry. Now for a, a loop ramp, in this case, this is actually a spiraled loop ramp. I've got a spiral in and a spiral out. And we'll do it. this. Uh, similar way here where we'll pick the direction. Again, we're going basically from the eastbound to the northbound direction. And so we wanna pick the alignments in the direction that the ramp would be moving. And then we pick the, the, the location of the quadrant. And this will show us right here what we're looking at. I hit enter. Um, again, we can pan through these design criteria, but in this case, I actually have a spiral curve spiral um, ramp that I want to use. And in this case, I'm actually going to pick that greater than 180 degree. And I can specify the spiral in and the spiral out. I've, I've set these up already just for the sake of time. And um, I'm also going to change the adjustment of this just a bit because it's not quite in this area. We've got a couple of tighter lanes through there. Um, so then again, when I hit OK, I can go and investigate this and see it's pretty close to what I want. And if I needed to adjust this just a bit, you know, I could do that. I'm going to pick no, no snaps or anything like that. And I, and I can adjust that. And again, I've got full access, full edit capability. So if I need to get into the geometry here and start reviewing it, let me pull this in for my other screen. Um, then I can start taking a look at what these values turn out to be. So I've got the, the editing capabilities there. So um, in summary, and I could go around the, the remainder of this particular model 
uh, just to finish out this clover leaf. But you can see that they're, they've, they've added some complexity and some additional features for those connected alignments. Um, one other thing, one last thing I want to show here as well, when we do the connected alignment, um, and let's pick uh, this one to this one. And right there, um, we can also connect the profile as well. So when we set these up, we've got the ability to match the profile that's beginning uh, where, where, where it starts out and where it concludes. And so this gives us some opportunity to, to utilize the profile information. So we're matching those up really well. Uh, and we can transition in between however it might work because we do have an overpass here. We're elevated through this bridge structure as it um, versus the, uh, the the northbound and southbound movements there. So that's a quick overview of the um, of the alignments, some of the alignment tools. Uh, again, really focused on interchange design and some of the more complex geometry that that roadway or you know alignment designers might have to come across. So with that, I am actually going to transition now into InfraWorks. So, um, and I want to start out by showing some of the things that um, are really cool just to show some context. They have added right here, I'm going to zoom in so you can kind of see it, some additional ground cover. Um, before, a lot of the ground cover was more like this. It was a, basically a, tessellation, a tessellated pattern, which looks kind of cool when you zoom up to it, uh, but it might not be exactly what you need for for your particular model. In an area like this, um, this is an area that's in the Western United States, which is very arid. So you're not gonna see you know, green grass like this growing on the side of a road. You might see that in the, in the South or in, in the East, but not, not, in, the, not in the Mountain West. Um, so something like ground cover like this might be more appropriate for what's actually you know, realistically out in our model. So the way that we set this up and um, let me zoom out here and I'm going to add a field of, well, I don't know, we'll add a field of weeds over here or something like that. So under the create tab, under environment, we can go to stand of trees. Um, we've created a row of trees right there. We can do that. But in this case, we can pick a stand of trees and I've actually got vegetation marked right there. I could search for a couple of other items, but there have been a lot of items that have been added to the InfraWorks database as far as adding context to any kind of our models. And so um, here, let's find, you know what, we're going to add some dandelions. Why not? So once we select what we want, we can actually create our shape just as we would with uh, some, sort of, uh, some sort of perimeter. And when I double click on that, we will see that that is going to show up. Now, I've only got four weeds that showed up. I want a whole field of them. So I'm going to close this. I'm actually going to escape out of that. So if I if I hit escape once, I can actually adjust the density. Maybe I don't want any, maybe I want a whole, whole bunch of them. So if I increase the density, we can kind of see how this works. And you know, if, if we want, we can actually resize some of these things. Maybe we've got a massive weed there. But um, anyway, the, the point of this is that it gives you an opportunity to add some context to some of our drawings. So, and again, we can adjust this play with some of these values just a little bit to make it more realistic. So again, uh, kind of a cool feature that was added there. Um, and again, it was really just to create more of these detail rich models that InfraWorks is really, uh, really good at, at doing. The, the next thing that I'm going to show is in regards to some of the uh, the roadway features when it comes to replacing decorations, barriers or fences or things along our alignment itself. And I'm going to go into a different model here. So I've got a, a, a mountain corridor through this area. And this is in uh, in Colorado. And in this area, it's um, we're going through Glenwood Canyon next to the Colorado River. And it goes in and out of tunnels and things like that. But what I've done here in this particular model is I've imported a couple of different corridors from uh, some corridors from Civil 3D. And so they're directly linked to my, my Civil 3D model. What I can do here, um, and if anybody who's used InfraWorks in the past, um, I can place decorations along my corridor and it's gonna ask me for, let me move this up here. And I'm gonna select a barrier and I'm gonna actually pick, let's pick a concrete barrier. Um, it will let me pick along my alignment where I want that barrier to show up, but I can actually pick some of the other alignments of some of the other corridors that have been placed there. So I wanna place a, a barrier right there and we can see how wonky that looks right now. It's not at all what we want, but I'm gonna show you what we're gonna do. So we'll pick one right there and then I'll close out of that and I'll just hit escape to cancel out of that. So I've got this and anybody who's ever used the roadway decorations in the past, you realize that you know that this is the kind of thing that might take a little bit of time 
to work through. They have updated the way that this, this all updates now. So if I see this, I'm at the wrong angle, I'm at the wrong spacing, I've, everything is wrong on this. So I need to make some adjustments to the parameters. So I wanna change the rotation to 90 degrees, I'm gonna hit enter. Now, anybody who's worked with this before knows that anytime you would change any parameter on this, the whole thing would have to regenerate. And every time you made a, the slightest change to this, that's what would happen. They've made it now so that these will update automatically. And I'm doing this all in real time. So let's see what 12 feet spacing looks like for these barriers. Not a, It's not quite right. We've got a gap there. So maybe we've got a 10 foot barrier. Yeah, that looks like about right. You know, we could make that even tighter if we wanted to. Um, but what this allows us to do is we can really make our, this is gonna be a huge time savings more than anything else, but it gives us the opportunity. Let's say I wanna go eight feet on that one or something. They'll overlap just a little bit, but these, these elements update automatically. So now if I need to change the, the limits of my stationing here, again, I don't have to wait for the entire model to update in order to do that. If I hit that at 24 and hit enter, if I zoom out, yeah, see, so that moved right there. And again, if I grab the, the ends of, of uh, of my barrier in this area, it's going to update fairly quickly, and and it doesn't require a regenerate. Again, this is more for a time savings. This is hopefully going to be something that is much more of a uh, a design efficiency when it comes to creating these context rich these context rich models within InfraWorks, and and really gives everyone an opportunity to just to see what what you can do with InfraWorks, and it, it, there, there's a lot of really cool things. Not to mention, you can really uh, iterate through some of these models um, to see what it might look like if I'm going to add, you know, a, a fence along here, or or lighting, or or something uh, along those lines. And I've got a whole library of items that I can actually add um, when I do that. And again, that's just when I select my my corridor and place the different roadway decorations. And I've got a lot of different a lot of different elements that I can do in there. So um, with that, don't have a whole lot else that I'm uh, gonna show with this because I'd like to save the, the rest of the time for, for Andy. And um, Andy, I'm gonna let you go ahead and, and take over from there to show some of the other features with, uh, with InfoWorks. Okay, thanks, Ben. So what I will do now, I'll just share my screen and then we can talk about complex 3D girders. Okay, so hopefully you can uh, you can see that. Yep, okay, so okay, so um, complex three D girders. Um, really, this is about um, it's it's new functionality that is really bringing the technology that we have already for our other bridge parts, such as uh, abutments and piers, to um, the girders themselves. So. Um, at the moment, currently, the girders are uh, based on 2D sketches, which are then simply extruded when we get into InfraWorks. Um, so they are, they, that methodology works really well for uh, most common uh, girder deck type bridges, um, but there's little, little scope really for adding detail um, along the uh, extrusion itself, which is, um, which is difficult for more complex bridges that um, uh, need uh, maybe diaphragms or specific end treatments, things, things of that nature. Um, so um, as I say, the other, other bridge parts are, are more complex, they're, they're actually um, you know, individual 3D modeled entities in, in their own right. Um, and you can add a, a high level of parametric, parametric intelligence to these. Um, and uh, it's going to make uh, modeling complex girders uh, much, much faster. Um, they're going to be the same as all the other parts, fully 3D parametric entities. Um, and uh, you'll be able to build in this, this high level of parametric intelligence, which we, uh, which we need. So what I'm going to do is I thought we could have a quick look at one of the, um, one of the 3D, 3D girders that are supplied with InfoWorks. So you can see this Super T here. Um, 
is not just a simple extrusion. It's, uh, it's got a number of uh, different features. So you can see we have some diaphragms uh, running along the center here, and we have some uh, end treatments here, which are made up of a, a number of um, discrete features. So if I just draw this up to the top here, um, you will see that is actually what um, it's, it's been made from. And if I go to this sketch, we should I would have a quick look at that. So that is the, that is the 2D sketch, which is the, the, the basis of the girder. So we've got some, you can see we've got some uh, parameters identifying the general geometry. Um, and then as we draw, as we draw this back down, you'll see um, additional parts or additional features being added as we uh, as we move as we move along. Okay, and then I'll draw that back down to the bottom there. Okay, so that's that's all in. So what we can do if we um, just have a look at one of these. So this is one of the features. This cut on this uh, on this right hand side here. Um, the power of uh, this functionality really is that you're able to um, make these features conditional. So uh, you may have many different girders um, along a similar vein, but with slightly different um, end treatments, um, or you want to make those end, treatment, end treatments flexible. So you can build all that in um, to very few girders. You don't need a a new girder for each one. And we can do that by suppressing these features uh, on an individual basis. So if we just look at the properties for this particular feature, we'll see that there is a parameter that's been added to uh, this uh, inventor model um, called has right cutaway at end one. And if that parameter is equal to zero, then that will be suppressed. And when we get into InfoWorks, these parameters can be added as uh, toggles uh, in the interface, and you can just toggle these features on and off um, as you're modeling. And it's a really powerful feature. Let's get rid of that. So what I thought we could do is, um, I mean, time means I'm not gonna be able to sit here and, and model a full girder like this, and it probably wouldn't be the most exciting uh, thing for everyone to, to witness. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm just going to um, I'm just going to start something completely from scratch, just so that we can have a quick um, just have a quick look at how we how this is done. Okay, so just start a new one. Okay, so we'll go over to the left hand side here. And I want to start this, uh, my first sketch um, in the XZ plane. So it's going to go there and then say new sketch. And I'm just going to orient myself how I prefer. So I'm in the XZ and then I've got Y coming out of the, uh, coming out of the screen. So I'm going to create a rectangular shape. So that's going to be the basis of our, our girder. So I'm going to get 750 deep, like so. Finish that. And this is our, this is going to be our shape. Okay, so that's the, the main section and we're going to extrude that. Okay. So I can grab all of that and you can see this, this will extrude. Now the distance or the, the length of this girder is in fact going to be determined by the spacing of the piers, which is actually an InfoWorks. So um, what we'll do is instead of giving it a, a finite uh, length, we will use a parameter for that. Which will which uh, which will be used in Infoworks. So Infoworks will find out what the length is required to be, or pass that to this parameter, and it will model automatically. So 
in here, what I will type in, and I know this particular parameter, it's called segment length. So segment length. equals and then I'm just going to give it a um, a random a random number just so we've got something to model with and yeah okay okay and you can see that it's it's modeled that for me so now I want to perform some sort of end treatment to this so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to find UCS pop that in there and then uh, we'll have X over there, Y over there. Okay, so now I'm gonna model in this plane here. So if I go to uh, UCS, I want the Y, Z plane. So Y, Z, that's the one at the top and say new sketch. And now I'm in that orientation, I'll just create another rectangle something like that. Okay, and then if we extrude that, you'll see it cuts it off. Now it doesn't need to be that wide. So I'll just move it in like so. But you'll see as I as I move this, it sort of takes a chunk out of the, the end. So I'll, I'll push it out there somewhere. Okay, so we've got that cut on the end and just to make it a little bit more interesting, We'll, we'll put affiliate at the top like that. Okay, so that's the um, that's the shape. You know, it's uh, just pretty simple, just something to show the, the the functionality really. So now what we need to do is to make that conditional. So we go up to um, these parameters, and you see it's already put that one in there, segment length for us. But we need to create a, a new one, and I'll just say has cut. Okay, we want to change the dimensions to dimensionless. Okay, so we don't want dimensions. We just want it to be a toggle for uh, either, you know, one or zero. So I've done that. And now if I go to extrusion, right click properties, I can now say if, and there's the um, parameters in there, if has cut is equal to zero, Suppress it, okay, and then I'll do the same for the uh, same for the fillet. Okay, so that's the the finish of that. So now all we need to do is go up to uh, the parameters, and what we need to do is we just need to export or tell the system which parameters we want to export. So I'm just going to, I'm going to export all of them. Um, you don't have to actually, but um, sometimes it's quicker to do this rather than to work out which ones you need. So I'll just put those through there and then we can export these to InfoWorks. So infrastructure, part shape utilities, export template. I'm going to put it in there and I'm just going to call this one, two, three, four. Okay, so that's now that's now exported. And then if I go to InfoWorks, you'll see we have this, we have this bridge model here. And to bring it in, we just go to manage star palette, go down to parametric models, bridges, I'll put it in girders, uh, and I'll just say add. We'll go and find it. I'm doing this quite quickly because we're running out of time. So I've selected the one that we've just exported. That's pulled it in. It's a bridge. It's a, it's a girder. It's not an extruded girder. It's a 3D girder. Okay. It's, it's looking for uh, some parameters which I haven't put in, and that's okay for, for this, but in a production environment, you would make sure all of those uh, were ticked in green. Um, and then I'll go to uh, the user interface appearance. And this is this has cut um, parameter and I can change it from an integer to a toggle and that'll make it a lot more convenient. Um, we can then select 
uh, which one of these parameters we want to see uh, visible. And then we can just hit OK. And now my newly created girder, such that it is, has now been added to the InfraWorks library. So we can close that down now. And if I select the bridge and select that girder, I can now select and change it to the one we just created, which is this one. And you can see it is now brought in that girder. And if we look to the right hand side, we can see we now have a toggle for this feature. So I can now turn that off. And that, that feature is now suppressed. I'm going to turn it back on. Okay, and so that's acting now like a, the same as, as any other um, bridge part that, that would be available to you in InfraWorks. Okay, so we have run on. I'm sorry about that, but uh, I'm finished now. So over to you, Ben, for the q and I think. All right, thanks, Andy. Um, um, good work. Uh, John and Andy, we've got a handful of questions, as you can imagine. Um, more questions than we're going to be able to get to. But uh, John, as you can imagine, most of the questions were related to grading optimization. I think the most common question that we got was in regards to uh, choosing the direction of the slope. Um, so some of the questions were regarding like, can you, if if you grade it one direction, can you reverse that? Um, how can I, how can they control the, the slope across a, a sidewalk? Um, so that was one of the big, big questions. A, a lot of them were in regards to grading um, around um, controlling the direction of the grade. Okay, so there's a couple different ways you could do that. Um, and I think I did actually answer a couple of those questions. Um, you can control the direction of how it's going to slope uh, with, a, with a drain line, okay? So if you want things to flow north to south, all right, then you would place your drain line at the south and it would, it would uh, control the grading that direction. So it would drain everything to the south. Um, same thing if you went east to west, but that's how one way that you can do it. Like for the sidewalk specifically, you could use your minimum inclination. Uh, that's a feature inside of the zone. And basically that, that uses the AutoCAD compass. Okay, so I say compass, you've got zero, 90, 180, 270. All right, so it uses that compass. So you can set it, if you wanted it to flow at like, you know, 315 degrees, then you just change that mental inclination and it will, it'll push that at that particular direction. Um, that's something that you do have to iterate back and forth with just a little bit. Um, but it is again very easy to do. So there's a couple different ways that you can control that. Great. Um, had a couple of questions regarding ADA handicap zones, things like that. Um, and wanted to know um, the way that it recognizes the slope. Will it recognize longitudinal versus cross slope? Because a lot of time in the industry, um, you know, they'll they're concerned about the longitudinal slope, but then they're concerned about the uh, you know the, the the aggregate slope, the cross slope for things like ADA ramps or or ramps like that. Is there a way to to monitor? Or... Well, it doesn't really. There's no cross slopes yet, um, but you know you may have to go back in on like an ADA ramp and actually tweak the ramp a little bit uh, with feature lines even after uh, grading optimization is giving you the the surface. So uh, that's one thing that I do want to point out is that there, there was a question about that. Um, it does return feature lines to you. You can adjust those any way you want, just like you do regular feature lines, or you can add to the feature lines with additional work to, to do that more finite grading, like those handicap ramps. Um, as far as checking the slope, if you, like I did with the, the sidewalk here, I just gave it a 1% min, 2% max. Um, it will stay in that range uh, for for the sloping. That would most likely be longitudinal, not cross. But if you wanted to change the direction of how it was flowing, again, you could do the same thing with the minimum inclination also. Okay. Um, a lot of good questions. A lot of really great suggestions too. You know, from from a lot of our audience. So really, thank want to thank everybody for your participation for for watching. A um, couple other questions, and then then we'll finish out. But um, uh, John, as far as uh, grading optimization is concerned, is it available only for the Civil 3D 2021, or can it be used on 2020 or previous versions? Had a lot of questions regarding that. It's actually um, only available for Civil 3D 2022. 
Um, and you do need to have the AEC collection. Okay, very good. Okay, um, Andy, really, real quick uh, question regarding um, the uh, the structural outline. Um, is there is it possible? Uh, some of the questions regarding Inventor. Uh, one of the questions was, um, is is it possible to use Revit uh, features or, or to create some of these girders with Revit rather than Inventor? Um, no, does, it's, does it, it is Inventor. It is Inventor only. Um, and the reason for that, it's, it, it's easier and, and far more flexible for um, for this particular workflow. Okay, yeah. very good. Okay, with that, guys, um, we could spend another hour answer the, answer the questions again. Thanks, everybody, for your participation. A lot of good questions, um, a, a lot of very uh, relevant questions. Really hope that this is going to be something that's going to be beneficial to, to you and your workflows. So um, with that, I think I'll hand it back off to, to Rita or we'll conclude. Yes, thank you everyone for joining. Um, I hope this was helpful. Um, I think we are ready to close this webinar. Thank you again, everyone.